it's an honor to, to, to share the Word of God, um, but it's also an honor to see what God is doing in SIBKL and then look at what God says in the book of Joshua and go, wow, this is what God is showing us and doing in our lives. I remember two weeks ago, Pastor Lee Chu shared uh, something uh, um, that has been spoken over this church. And I just want to honor Pastor Lee Chu for that because she mentioned, and you may, you may remember this, uh, that there was a service sometime in November where God repeated uh, a phrase to SIBKL that this church will not just, sorry, this church will be a movement and not a monument. You know, when I heard that, I was excited. You know why? Because I was there. That was, I was preaching. <laughs> that was the last time I was preaching. Uh, and I remember that moment because it threw my sermon apart. But it was God. God reminding us that this church will be a movement. And you will see a lot of movement in the book of Joshua. But this church will be a movement and not a monument. It will not be like Babel. That was the first time someone said, let's build a monument to ourselves. It will be a movement. And a movement is one that needs direction. It's one that needs guidance. It's one that needs strength and empowerment when you are moving. And that's what God does. And you will see that in the whole of Joshua, in the life of Israel, and in our church as well. So as you look through Joshua, as you read through, I, I don't know if, how many of you have read the entire book of Joshua before? This is a little survey I want to do, because I want to encourage you to do this, all right? The book of Joshua up to Joshua chapter 11, 11 to 12, around there, halfway through, is very exciting. Conquer, 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 win, 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 you know, all of that. And then the next half of Joshua, not so exciting, right? This one is your city, this one is your district, this one is city of refuge, this one is... And, and what I want to encourage you to do is this. Oh yes, and then it ends with Joshua, I think 24, when Joshua gives his final address, and then everybody wake up again. Like, oh, and then you say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, right? And so everybody's like, Joshua chapter 1, halfway through, whoa, shock, uh, and then sleep for a while, then wake up again, Joshua 24, 15. Now my encouragement to you is this, as we go through Joshua, don't sleep. Go through every single chapter because every single chapter has value and meaning and, and, and sim well, I would say symbolism, but a lot of it has to do with the, the, even the names of the cities and the locations of the cities of refuge and where they are repeated once again throughout the history of Israel make sense. And so when you, when you draw the dots and you, you know, fix them like a, a jigsaw puzzle, you go like, wow, actually uh, Joshua chapter 19 makes sense. Joshua chapter 18 makes sense. And it, and it excites you because then you see the whole Bible come together in the formation of Israel in the book of Joshua. So I want to encourage you. That's just my little encouragement to you. Um, next one is greetings again from LifeGen. That's, that's the, the church plant of SIBKL that I pastor. Um, and I just want to offer you our greetings uh, together with Pastor Mike and Pastor Tabby. Uh, we, we love you guys. We're so much excited with what God is doing as a church as a whole, including uh, LifeGen. This year, our theme is Speak Life. And what you will hear from this message uh, and what God does in Israel, we want to we declare that over our church. We want to declare that what God, is going to, what God did for Israel at that time is what God is doing and continually doing in our lives and in this church. And so when we speak life over this church, when we're declaring God's promises, when we're declaring God's uh, desires and purposes over this church, this church will move in the direction that God has for it. And if we move in that direction, like Pastor Jeffrey was sharing just now, this is the path, walk in it. If we move in that direction, that direction will lead us into the best place that God has for us. Don't turn left, don't turn right. Walk in the direction that God has 
for us. I also want to say this. We started off Joshua, uh, with Joshua chapter 1 to chapter 4, uh, up till two weeks ago. And it's a very, very powerful segment of Joshua because this is where God speaks to Joshua, empowers him and says, be strong and very courageous. Then there's that season of consecration. And then the most powerful miracle that I think the generation of the, the, the generation of the children of Israel at that time would have seen was the crossing of the Jordan. Seen. They would have heard of the Red Sea. And maybe a few of them would be, would be witnesses of that, perhaps Joshua and Caleb themselves. But for the majority of this generation of the children of Israel, the most powerful miracle they probably would have seen at that time, by that time, is the crossing of the Jordan. And so this was awesome. You've got a generation of Israelites now saying, we are at this border and we're going to walk into the promised land. And then they experience such an encounter with a powerful miracle of God that they are able to walk through, cross the Jordan, and there they are at a place called Gilgal. And they lay this memorial of stones to say, if your kids next time ask you what happened, you tell your kids, this memorial reminds us of what God did for the nation of Israel at the crossing of the Jordan during the flood in the harvest season. And it was a powerful, powerful miracle telling us that God is with us. And then as a church, we did what I believe was very, very pivotal. We paused. We paused studying Joshua and we spent an entire weekend worshiping God. We spent an entire weekend worshiping God. You know what that reminds me of? When they crossed the Red Sea, Miriam, Miriam and the, the, the dancers representing the nation of Israel, praising God, worshiping God. When we crossed the Jordan, there was no specific scripture that says they, they all you know, stopped for two days and then they worship God. But as a church, as we're journeying with Israel and looking at what God is doing in our church, we stop. We pause and we praise God. We stop and we pause and we praise God. You know why? Joshua tells us, Joshua chapter 5 tells us that this miracle is no joke, one, all right? This miracle was so awesome that all the Canaanites who heard this story, their hearts melted with fear. I know Valentine's Day is coming up, and you know, women, you're waiting to get your hearts melted. But this is not that kind of heart melting, you know. This is melting in fear. Now, for you to have experienced such a powerful miracle, being the one who receives that miracle, I'm, a, I'm, I'm the nation of Israel, I'm a recipient of that miracle, the miracle that no other Canaanite God can do. Small g. No other Canaanite, small g, God can do. I am going to pause and worship God. That was why I think last weekend was so powerful. Because we paused and we worshiped God. But let's come to Joshua chapter 5. We're going to start looking at what God is going to do to Israel now that they have crossed into the promised land. I'm going to start off with Joshua chapter 5, verse 1. And so if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to just turn, turn with me to Joshua chapter 5. We won't read through both chapters. I'm doing 5 and 6 today. We won't read through both chapters. Um, but I, I want to bring you through certain things, like, uh, certain passages in Joshua that, God, uh, that shows what God did in the nation of Israel at that time. Joshua chapter 5, verse 1. As soon as all the kings of the Amorites and all the kings of the Canaanites heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over, their hearts melted. I told you this is not right. Their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. Imagine that you're the nation of Israel. You've, you've had a bit of fighting experience. You've, you've defeated some 
kings uh, in, the, in the wilderness period, Og, king of Bashan, Sihon, king of the Amorites, and, and you've had some fighting experience. You're facing the Canaanites now, and your past 10 spies who went ahead previously told you, wow, fortresses, giants, the, this one, uh, no joke. But they're so huge that as, as an army, they're, 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 they're such a formidable force. And so you're crossing the Jordan now, and God shows you such a powerful miracle that the Canaanites who hear this, hearts are melted with fear because of what they've heard God do for the Israelites. What's the next thing you do? Fight her! Now's the time to do it, man. When, they, when their hearts are melting with fear, we will go and war at them and, and they, they, they have no time to pick themselves up and we will win, man. We just go sit there after city, like go after Jericho, go after Ai, go after all these other cities in Canaan. But you notice that Joshua chapter 5, there is no fighting. Joshua chapter 6 is the conquest, the conquest of Jericho. But Joshua chapter 5, still no fighting. And then Joshua chapter 5 tells us a few things that God and Israel do before the conquest starts. So it's almost like saying, hey, I know you're very excited, but not yet. Not yet. I'm not through with you yet. In fact, what I, I've still got things to do in your life. I've still got things to do it to the, for the nation of Israel to prepare them to conquer Canaan. So not yet. Let's go through the preparation before you conquer Canaan. There is still more preparation I want you to go through. This is not military preparation. This is not financial preparation. I don't know how many of you, when, when I was a kid, we used to play uh, some of this, or, well, I, I played less, uh, my, my brother played more, sorry. Um, but uh, we used to play these computer games where, you know, like Age of Empires. And, and for you to play Age of Empires and for you to have this army to fight, you have to have agriculture, you have some sort of money-making or, or industry going on first, and then you have the money to raise an army and fight. So, so if you were going to conquer land and cities and, and territories and, and armies, uh, you would need to perhaps have financial preparation. Perhaps some military preparation, some military training, um, you know, set up an army, do all that. But God does not do anything of that for Israel's preparation. In fact, it is a spiritual preparation. Three things that God does. He engages Israel to be involved in. And the sum effect of all those three things that God tells Israel to do is to prepare Israel to remember one thing and one thing alone before they conquer Canaan. And that one thing alone is this. Israel is mine. Israel is mine. Who owns Israel? Not the people of Israel. Israel is my people. And because Israel is my people, I will set Israel up to succeed. I will set Israel up to succeed in the purposes and the plans I have for them. Going through all these three things, and we will look through them separately, but going through all these things together reminds Israel that where you are at now and your identity is that you are the Lord's. And because you are the Lord's, the Lord will do what He can and what He will in order for you to succeed in the purposes and plans that He has for Israel. That promise He gave to Abraham and said, your descendants will, will rule and will own these lands, will possess these lands. But I will prepare you first to remember that you are mine. And then you will see how I set you up for success. 
So, when I coined the title, Follow the Pattern, the reason for that is this. There is a pattern that God sets in the preparation of Israel. There is a pattern in the preparation. So, you may realize that when Israel starts conquering cities and, and territories, there is particular, no particular pattern. One moment you march around the walls, one moment the sun stands still, one moment you do an ambush from behind. Different ways and strategies, but there is no particular pattern to follow. The pattern is in the preparation before they conquer Canaan. What pattern did God set? Three things that God does. First of all, He sets Israel apart from the nations. Secondly, He sets Israel under His protection and provision. And third one, He sets Israel up with His army. So, just repeat this after me, all right? So, we're going to remember this. Three things that God does for Israel. He sets Israel apart. So, say, say after me, all right? So, sets Israel apart. Sets Israel under. And sets Israel up. Set apart. Let's look at set apart. The first thing you see in Joshua chapter 5 is the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. So the first thing God instructs Joshua to do and the Israelites is for all the sons of Israel to be circumcised. Now the Bible doesn't say very clearly when the first time took place. Right, it says here second time, right? So when did the first time take place? And we estimate or believe that it was probably before the first Passover in Egypt. The reason for that is this, because you cannot partake of the Passover if you are not circumcised. Guys, huh? guys, all right? So you cannot partake of the Passover if you are not circumcised. So uh, possibly around that time was the first time. The thing is this, the Bible also says in Joshua chapter 5, that when the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, there was no circumcision uh, rite conducted, whether individually or as a community. All right? And so when, when you read Joshua chapter 5 and it says, circumcise the sons of Israel a second time, it's because the majority, if not all of the, of the, the sons of Israel at Gilgal had not yet been circumcised. And so he said, and so God told Joshua, do this. And so, and so they did that. So the question then is this, why? Why do this whole circumcision right for all the sons of Israel at that time? What's so important about circumcision? Circumcision was God's way of having Abraham and his descendants to participate in the covenant God was making. So I'm going to repeat that. Let's think about this. Circumcision was God's way of having Abraham and his descendants participate in the covenant God was making with Abraham and his descendants. I'm going to take you back to Genesis chapter 17 to see where this takes place. Genesis chapter 17, God tells Abraham, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. I'll stop there. The covenant is that I will be your God, not just to you, but to your offspring after you. So my promise to you is that I will be your God and I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So the promise now is twofold. One is I will be their God, and the second one is this land will be yours and for your offspring as well. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you, colon. Every male among you 
shall be circumcised. So what was God doing here at Gilgal with the sons of Israel in Joshua chapter 5? He was reminding Israel that there has been a covenant relationship between them and God. God is their God, and this land is for them. But this covenant, therefore, sets Abraham and his descendants and the nation of Israel apart from the nations around them. This covenant sets them apart from the nations around them. This relationship with God, this covenant relationship with God, carries God's promise to inherit the land of Canaan. And Israel's obligation under the covenant was circumcision. Perhaps one of the things, one of the things in this chapter that, has, that I've had to kind of grapple with quite a bit um, in preparation for today was, was this question, why circumcision? Like of all the things you could do in the world, why circumcision? Why not? You work hard, I promise you. Or you worship me only, I promise you. Why circumcision? And it's one of those things that sometimes puzzle me. And, and to, be, to be honest with you, it's still something that I, I try and get my head around under, around, under, and over. But here are three things that I think is very, 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 very relevant in Joshua chapter 5 and tells us why circumcision is important in the life of the nation of Israel and the covenant relationship that God has for them. First of all, the promises of God come first. God initiates it. The promises of God come first. God initiates it, and it is not dependent on our effort. So it is not a case of, if you work hard, I will promise you this. It's not. It's not dependent on effort. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. But God, out of His grace and, and love for His people, comes to the nation of Israel with a covenant promise, and He's the one who initiated it. It's not dependent on their effort. The second one is this, the cutting off. The cutting off is a representation of what we understand as, being, as, as dying to the flesh, as well as a setting apart of our body to God. Now, the cutting off of the foreskin, and, and, apologize, and I apologize if it sounds too graphic, um, but that's what it is, right? The cutting off of the foreskin has no magical uh, uh, nature to it. There's no magical you know, power to, to the circumcision. But what it does is it represents to us what it means to die to our flesh as well as to set apart our bodies to God. Because the third one, is this, circumcision is only symbolic and the Bible tells us that it is referred to as a seal, a seal confirming Abraham's faith in God. And where do I get this from? In Romans chapter 4, verse 11, Paul tells the church in Rome, talking about this argument about circumcision and, and whether or not Gentile believers need to be circumcised, he says this, he explains this, with regard to Abraham's, uh, uh, regard to the instruction for Abraham to, 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 to have circumcision, he says he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. Essentially, what that means is this justification, the righteousness that God imputes to us, is by faith, not by the act of circumcision. But the explanation to, the, to Romans 4 verse 11 in respect of this, in, in respect of Joshua chapter 5, is this. Circumcision is merely a symbolic act, basically saying that I want to participate in the covenant that God is making with the nation of Israel and because I want to be part of God's people, part of that covenant, I will undergo circumcision and become part of this community. Where do we see the net effect of this? Joshua chapter 5, 
verse 9. Very important. He says, because they went through that whole circumcision process, the Lord said to Joshua, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Interestingly, Gilgal means roll or rolling. And it comes from this particular uh, word that God uses when he spoke to Joshua. I will roll away the reproach of Egypt. Now what in the world is the reproach of Egypt? The reproach of Egypt is basically the ridicule that Egypt had on the Israelites when they were slaves because they were slaves. You see, if you're slaves for 400 years, what identity do you carry? You carry ridicule. You're laughed at, you're mocked at, you're treated as slaves, you have no identity. You, you don't belong. You don't belong in any way. And so they're just a bunch of people who are worth nothing more than slave laborers. That was who they were to Egypt. But over 40 years, taking, e taking the Israelites out of Egypt creating in them a nation of people, and now coming to Gilgal, circumcision seals the identity that the nation of Israel is a nation. It is a community of people called by God and having a covenant with God, and God calls them, you are mine. I will stand by you, I will protect you, I will cover you, you know who you are, and you know whose you are. You are mine. And so what I've done in that case is I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt. You don't carry any more condemnation for where you were. You don't carry any more uh, condemnation as you walk into the promised land. When the Canaanites look at you, they're not going to go, ah, just a bunch of slave laborers lah, trying to win the world. No. They will, they will look at you and go, this is the nation of Israel and we better watch out because you are mine. That was the covenant God was making and circumcision was Israel's way of participating in the covenant that God was making with Israel. And that is so important because what God is doing, like I said, the sum effect of God, what God is doing in those three things is saying, Israel is mine. Israel is my people. And so the first one that I want you to remember, O oh Israel, is that you are mine and I have a covenant relationship with you. Second one, set under. Set under the protection and the provision of God. Because what Israel does next is this. They keep the Passover or they observe the Passover. Now, the Passover was something they would already be doing in the wilderness because that was one of the laws of Moses. You, you keep this set of feasts, one of which is the Passover. And I don't think it's by coincidence that by the time they cross Jordan, it's time. It's time for the Passover, people. Let's not think about Jericho. Let's not think about Canaan. Let's keep the feast of the Passover. And that's what they did. That's what they did. Why? Because the Passover reminds them of what God did for them when they left Egypt. It reminded them of how God delivered them out of Egypt, how God executed judgment on Egypt and all the gods of Egypt, and how God passed over them because of the blood of the Lamb on the doorpost. Let me take you back to Exodus 12. Some of these passages, I'm sure, are familiar to you. We're going to remind ourselves as to what the Word of God says. Exodus chapter 12, verse 7. This was the instruction as to how the Passover is to be uh, observed, right? They shall take some of the blood, put it on the two doorposts, and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. And they shall eat the flesh that night of the lamb, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. More to go there, and then it says, it is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, 
and all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. And remember this as we go along with the rest of, this, of the rest of today's message. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a memorial day and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Why the Passover? The Passover reminded Israel about God's deliverance, God's protection, and God's provision over the nation. It's a, it's a memorial. You remember this. You remind yourselves that we were once slaves, but God in His love and in His power delivered us. We spent 40 years in the wilderness, but God in His love and in His power protected us, provided for us. He sent us manna. He, he gave us quail when we grumbled about the fact that there is no meat. He provided for us, protected us, made sure that our shoes never wore off. And now as we cross the Jordan into Gilgal, we remind ourselves that we are set under the protection and the provision of God. God reminded them that there was a covenant relationship. God now reminds them that you are under the protection and the provision of God. The net effect, manna ceased. It's a powerful thing in, in Joshua chapter 5, verse 12. And the manna ceased the day after they ate the produce of the land. The manna ceased. And then they ate the fruit of the land of Canaan. Manna spoke of the provision of the Lord over their lives where there was no food. But it does not mean that when manna ceased, the Lord does not provide anymore. When the manna ceased, it was because the Lord provided for them in the land of Canaan. Now you enjoy. Now you enjoy the fruit of the land of Canaan. You enjoy all the massive fruits that your spies once brought back. And now you get to eat this every day. And by the way, they haven't even started planting anything. This fruit of the land of Canaan was already there. And God's saying, have a feast. Enjoy. I'm providing for you. This is who you are under my covering. This is what you get under my covering. You get protection. You get provision. And this provision will come from the land of Canaan. As I promised you. It will be bountiful. It will be abundant. God has been and will still be providing for His people. And think about that. Conversely, without God, none of this would even be possible. And so the Israelites remind themselves that, yeah, you know, some of us, we go, uh, we, we work hard and we, and we get some provision and we, we thank God for that. But actually, at the back of your heads, it's like, if I didn't work, I won't get any of this, ma. But this is what God is telling Israel. What did you do to get the fruits of the land of Canaan? It was I who provided for you. I'm not saying be lazy. I'm saying you follow the direction that I have for you. You do what I call you to do. But you will always be under my protection and provision because Israel is my people. So not just do I have a covenant relationship with them, not just do I fulfill my promises under the covenant, I will protect them, I will provide for them. And last one is God sets Israel up with His army. This is the one that really got to me. This is the one that really stirred my heart because I can almost imagine a Star Wars scene as Joshua speaks to this man who is the commander of the army of the Lord, right? So, so Gilgal isn't exactly very near Jericho. Joshua gets out of Gilgal to look at Jericho, and I presume because he's the leader, the commander of the Israelite army at that point, he's going there to strategize. Like, hey, you know, maybe this part of the wall not so strong, or, you know, maybe the doors, I see the doors. Actually, sorry, he, he, 
I was going to say that he saw the doors open and close, but the Bible tells us they never open the doors um, of, of their fortresses. And so he's observing, he's thinking, this is maybe how I can do this. Maybe I lay a siege um, over the, 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 the water supply or whatever it is. So he's, he's there and he's observing Jericho. And then he sees this man with a drawn sword. And in my mind, I'm thinking, this guy is holding a lightsaber, right? He's, he's standing there, and he's like, you know, the, and I don't know what color you like, lah, huh? but he's holding this lightsaber, and, and Joshua looks at him and calls out, are you with us or our adversaries? Because I cannot recognize you at this point. Are you with us or for our adversaries? And then this guy with his drawn sword, you know, maybe, maybe he wants to, to talk to Joshua a bit more. He walks nearer to him and Joshua is like, you know, holding on his sword and, you know, getting ready to, to, to fight or whatever it is. And, and then this man says, neither. I am not for you or for your adversaries. In fact, he says, I am the commander of the army of the Lord and I have come. Think about that. You know, get your mind around this whole conversation that's taking place right now. Joshua, Israel, Israel is God's. Joshua, Jericho, and that is the enemy. You now have a third party in the picture coming to you and with, with his drawn sword. Okay, let's, let's, let's move the lightsaber out of the picture, all right? It's his drawn sword, all right? So he's drawn a drawn sword coming towards uh, uh, Joshua, and he's saying, are you on this side or that side? And then he says, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord, and I have come. And Joshua is quick, because immediately the next thing he does is this. He falls onto the floor. In, in, some, of the, in some of your versions, it would say he prostrates on the floor and worships him. and then on instructions, takes off his sandals. What just happened? Because he's, he's thinking, hey, God's on my side, right? I mean, Israel, Israel is going to conquer the land, promise God's promise. Jericho, I don't know how, but it's, gonna, it, it's, it's supposed to fall. I'm, I'm now trying to figure out and strategize my way to get around this city. And then here this guy comes and says, I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. Oh, snap. He falls on the floor, prostrates himself. He's, he's forgotten his strategies. He's forgotten everything else that he's tried to put his mind around. And he's saying, okay, he's here. Now, what happens next? Now, as far as Joshua is concerned, he's going like, what next now? Now, we know for sure, because Joshua worships this man, that man is not an angel. Because angels don't receive worship. That man is God. He may have the resemblance of Jesus Christ. We, we don't entirely know for sure, but it is not impossible to think that way. It's, it's, it's possible that he comes across to this man, person, this, this God personified as man, worships him, and then realizes the instruction is take off your sandals because this ground is holy, and he takes it off the same way Moses did at the burning bush. And so he realizes he's not talking to any man. He's not talking to, to, to an angel. He's talking to God. What has this encounter have to teach us? God was setting up Israel for success. But in order to do so, God had to remind Israel that in order to succeed, you have to be allied with him allied with Him? Are you allied with God? That's the question. That's the question he posed to Joshua because Joshua was saying, are you with me or are you with them? And then this man just identifies himself and then Joshua goes, okay, I'm with you. I don't care whether you're with me or not, I'm with you because I want to be on your side. I want to be on the side of the commander of the army of the Lord. Alliances are not new. 
You read about it in Genesis when Abraham went to war against kings that had allied themselves together. And, and the reason for alliances is because you want to come together, contribute of your army strength, contribute of your, you know, tactical strategies or whatever it is. You come, as an, you come and ally yourselves together with other kings. And so alliances were not new. But in this particular situation, the question that God posed to Joshua was, are you going to be allied with me? Are you going to be allied with me? Four things that God was teaching Israel. Firstly, God is entirely in control of Israel's success or failure. God is entirely in control. Think about this, all right? As a military power, Israel stood no chance. Up until the time of King Saul, Israel had no trained army, no full-time soldiers. Everybody were shepherds, farmers, uh, doing their own thing, maybe carpenters, whatever. They, they do their own little trade. And then when Israel went to war, if you see that phrase come up in Joshua or in Judges, when Israel went to war, they will go, okay, it's time, conscription time, come together, and then we, we take whatever weapons we have, and then we go to war. There was no army, there was no trained, full-time, specialized job as soldier in Israel. So, little experience, they, 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 and in fact, the experience of their success in the wilderness was a lot to do with God helping them rather than, you know, they, they strategizing and they training and they having blacksmiths set out weapons for them. No, it was more of God. When Aaron raised his hand, his staff, they won because God was with them. And that was always the case. So, little experience, no trained army, no specialized weaponry. Can you imagine what they looked like when they walked around Jericho? Sometimes we like to think of armies the way we see North Korea do their parades or the Russians do their parades. And for whatever reason, it's all communist countries, right? They, 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 they march in unison and they're all like stern-faced and they're like, if tomorrow atomic bomb come, I will defend this nation, you know, that kind of thing, right? And they're so, and, and then they, they send their tanks and their weapons and like, and so, and so you've got this parade of soldiers all set for war, marching around Jericho. Sorry, yeah, that's not the situation. The direction to Joshua was get the priests and then get your fighting men. But what kind of weapons do your fighting men have? Some presumably got swords. Lah. Some presumably got spears. Lah. Got some shields. Lah. But I guess the rest were rakes, agricultural tools, like, oh, I'm going to go for war. What do you have in your house? And then they bring along with them. You know why I know this? Because when Gideon conscripted his army against the Midianites, thousands came. But they all, their hearts were so melting with fear. And, all. and so Gideon, God told Gideon, look, if they want to go back, send them home. And then when, and so then, you know, like so many of them left. And then with the amount that was left, God then told Gideon, okay, you go and see how they drink water at the, at the pond or at the, at the lake. And the ones who look like they were a bit more prepared, you take them. The ones who go and stick their head in the water to drink water, you send them home. How many were left? 300. And if you've seen the movie 300, they're not like that. Those were Spartans, okay? City-state, all they do is fight, okay? So the, the Spartans, they, they train hard. They, they look like Gerard Butler, and you know, they've got all their you know, muscles and everything. Sorry, Gideon's 300, not like that. All they had to do was a horse, a torch, and a jar. Break the jar, scream out loud for Gideon and for, and for Israel, and then they charge down, and then God does everything else. Not a trained army. And every time they went to war, they had to trust God. Because if they went with their experience, kaput. That's the word my father taught me because he studied a bit of German, but it means die lah. Right? That's, that, was, that would be their history if it wasn't for God. So God is entirely in control of Israel's success or failure. Second one is this. This alliance is, not, uh, this alliance is an alliance of submission. 
You know when countries come together and they say, okay, we fight together, all right? They, they come bringing what you can contribute, your skills, your weaponry, your wisdom, your tactical strategies, all of that, right? You, you, you show about what you contribute. Israel got nothing to contribute, no. In fact, everything was up to God. And if you look at Joshua chapter 5 and 6, Joshua didn't even negotiate, no. God said, this is what you must do, you do it. You obey. This is an alliance of submission where God is in charge. Point being this, you've got the commander of Israel, Joshua, face to face with the commander of the army of the Lord. You have no say. You submit. You fall prostrate on the floor and you say, what does my Lord want me to do? That was what Joshua said. What does my Lord want me to do? This is an alliance of submission, obedience. The other thing that was really important is this. And, I'm, and the way I'm saying it, you, you take it and, 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 and take it at face value. God is not on your side. We are called to be on God's side. I know we like to say this, if God is for us, who can be against us? But if God is for you, you've got to be on His side. We are not, we are always called to be on God's side. Because when Joshua comes face to face with, with the commander of the army of the Lord, I don't care if you're on my side or not. I want to be on your side. I want to be on your side. I'm going to submit to you. I'm going to obey. You tell me what to do, I do. I want to be on your side. And the last one is this. God gets all the glory. God gets all the glory. Why do I know this? Joshua chapter 6. The first one is this. Joshua chapter 6 verse 2 says, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. The word there is, I have given Jericho into your hand. I, God, have given. There's a phrase in law that we learned since law school, but basically it's, it's a principle. You cannot give what you don't have. God cannot give Jericho to Israel if God did not own Jericho. If Jericho in the land of Canaan was not God's, he cannot give it to anybody. But because God owns Jericho, God owns the territories, God can decide who he wants to give it to. And so, the, and so what God is telling Joshua is this, I am the one who is giving Jericho to you. I am the one who owns all these lands, all these cities, and anytime you succeed in a war against any of these kingdoms, it is because I have delivered them up to you. I have given them to you. Who gets the glory? Joshua? No. God. Because it was not Joshua's doing. God gave them up to Joshua and to the nation of Israel. Second one is this, Joshua chapter 6, 17 to 19. And this was the instruction as far as what do you do when Jericho falls? The city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. All silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. That was the instruction. So when Jericho falls, all of you, when you march into Jericho or when you conquer Jericho, everything in the city is devoted to destruction. The, in some of your passages or some of your versions, it will say that it will be an offering to the Lord. Like a first fruits of your success in Canaan. It will be offered to the Lord, meaning you take none of it. You glorify God by saying, I will take none of this. And every gold, every silver, every bronze, every iron that is collected, which would normally be, become spoils of war, you go and send it to the treasury of the Lord. So everything is the Lord's. God gets all the glory. God gets all the credit for the conquest of Canaan. Why? Because what God is essentially saying is this, I have set you up for the purpose, to succeed in the purposes and plans that I have for you. 
I get the glory. Not the nation of Israel. I get the glory. But my people, my people will be, uh, my people will be the people I have covenant relationship with that I will protect and I will provide for and I will set them up to succeed. I will set them up because of my promise to them. There is no pattern in the victory. Like I said, sometimes you march around one time, once a day for six days, seven days, you march around seven times, shout, and then for whatever reason, God then lets the walls fall down. The strongest stronghold in Canaan fall like that. But then it doesn't happen, it doesn't repeat itself. You go to Ai, and it's a different strategy. And as you go through the different cities, the sun stands still, and, and, and some of them, Joshua doesn't just write, down, doesn't write them down at all. He just says, okay, we conquered this city, we conquered this city, we conquered this kingdom, we conquered this kingdom, the southern kingdoms, the northern kingdoms, all of that we conquered. There was no pattern in the victory, but there was a pattern in the preparation. There was a pattern in the preparation set apart for God, set under God's protection and provision, and set up by God for success. My title was Follow the Pattern. What happens if you don't follow the pattern? Two stories in Joshua tell you what happens if you don't follow the pattern. One guy named Achan, or if he's Chinese, was Atan, <laughs> took gold from Jericho for himself. And Israel lost soldiers at the, at the first attempt to capture the city of Ai. Second one, a group of people came to Joshua and said, can you be allied with us? Or can we be allied with you? Can we become allies? They were the Gibeonites or the Hivites. And when they allied themselves with somebody else, they failed in following the pattern. And it became a sore thumb to the nation of Israel. So the task for us today is this. If this is what God is doing for Israel, and if as a church we're journeying with Israel and we've crossed the, crossed the Jordan with Israel, what is God doing in this church as we move forward to take the future? God is preparing us. And there is a pattern to the preparation. Three things that God does in preparing us that tells us S-I-B-K-L is mine. And if you always remember in your minds that this church, this people is the Lord's, the covenant relationship that He has with us, the protection and the provision that He, puts, that he provides for us, and the alliance that we have in obedience and submission to Him in fulfilling the purposes that God has for us, then we're set up to succeed. We're set up to be able to do what God has called us to do. We're set up to be able to enjoy the promises of God over our lives and over this church. And that is what God is calling us to do before we conquer. God is preparing us. What does it look like as a church today as Christians? Jesus Christ. The three things that God did, the, the, the covenant of circumcision as a sign of the covenant, Jesus was the one who was ultimately cut off from His people for the sake of His people. And we benefit from the sacrifice and the death of Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus' blood, we get to experience the protection and the provision that God has for each and every one of us and for this church. And because of Jesus' resurrection, not only do we have provision, but we have abundant life and a purpose to live out for. God has ultimate control and power over everything because He resurrected. And because we know that He has power over everything and that He has ultimate control, we ally ourselves with Him. And we say, God, we stand with You. What You want us to do, we do. Where you want us to go, we go. What your purposes and plans are, we will follow. Because that's how you set us up for success. 
I call it a pattern because this pattern repeats itself over and over again in our lives. Every day we're reminded or we're asked to remind ourselves, who is Lord over your life? We're asked to remind ourselves, who's the one who has been providing for you and protecting you and taking care of you? We're always asked to remind ourselves, who is walking with us? And are we submitting to God? And when we do this and we follow this pattern day after day, month after month, week in, week out, if this church is your Gilgal and you are reminded of these three things, then God is preparing us as a church, as a community to say, we are to be able to conquer and fulfill the purposes that God has for us, that we can move forward and take the future. So my last parting shot to you is this. What do we do? Two things. I want to encourage us to stay humble. Submit to God. Submit to His leading. Acknowledge that where we are at is not so much our effort, but entirely God's over our lives. Stay humble. Submit. If Israel was a ragtag army of farmers, shepherds, agriculturalists, and priests, we're not trained. We're not full-time soldiers in war, just like Israel was, just like Israel wasn't. But they totally relied and trusted in God for everything. Stay humble. And second, something Pastor Chiu shared in the first weekend, trust the process. Preparation is about process. Preparation is not where you see the success. Preparation is about the process of making you become someone who is able to succeed. And a lot of our lives will not be at the destination, at the success point. A lot of our lives, 90%, 99% of our lives is in the preparation. The part of our lives where we don't see always what God is doing. But if we remind ourselves that we are in covenant relationship with God, that we are God's people and we live and God is ours. Secondly, that we would be able to remember and remind ourselves that we're under God's protection and provision. And thirdly, we walk with God in where He's called us to. You will eventually see God's leading and guiding and the success and the destination. But there is a preparation process that we trust and God will take us through it. So can I get all of you to just rise? We're going to worship God. And even as you think through what God has spoken to you today and what the Holy Spirit has revealed to you, we're going to worship God and, and, and say, come, make me pure as gold. I want to submit my life to you. I want you to have my life and, and to, to take over my life and to lead me and to, and to have control over my life. As we do that, let God begin to remind you once again those moments when, when you remember God's provision, when you walked with God and you saw the hand of God over your lives and say, God, I want to do this again with you. I just feel that there's a word today for some of you here who are looking at your Canaan, your Jericho, and you feel very inadequate. I'm not sure what that means for you specifically. Maybe it's a family matter or a work matter or relationship. But you believe and you know that God is calling you to do something and you feel very out of your depth. You feel very inadequate. You're like, God, I'm like that Israelite army who has no training, no weaponry, no experience. But I know you've called me for something and I feel very, very inadequate. And if that is you, can I just encourage you to place your hand over your heart? Just place your hand over your heart because that is precisely where God wants to touch. And I'm just going to say a prayer for you even as we close. Because I know that what God is going to do for us as a church and for us individually 
is He's going to step us out into places that only God knows where we're going to go. He's going to step us out into places where, where we can see from our own eyes that this is not easy, this is difficult, this is beyond me, and that is precisely where we will encounter God. And so, Father, for all of my brothers and sisters here who have just placed their hands over their heart, knowing, Father, that whatever you have called them to do may sound so impossible or so difficult, I, I speak such reliance and trust to arise inside of them, a reliance and trust in you, because you've called us your people, because you've set us under your protection and your provision, and because you've called us to ally ourselves with you. And so for each and every one of them, even for myself, Lord, and the things that you've called me and, and in, for this church, as we take on the future and whatever that holds, Lord, we commit our lives to you and we say we will trust in you and we will trust in the preparation process that you are taking us through. Remind us of our relationship with you. Remind us of your provision for us and your protection. And remind us that you've called us to be on your side. And we take each step, each day, each moment, and we're going to see you set us up to succeed in the purposes and plans that you have for us. God, we thank you. For those of you who are online, we, we say that same prayer over your lives and believe that what God is going to do in your life will also be awesome and powerful. And what God is going to do for us as a church as we move forward and take the future is one where we completely place our reliance and our trust, not in man, not in ourselves, but in the God who has relationship with us, has always been with us, and now says, come alongside me, and I will bring you into the land and the promise that I have for you. So Father, I pray that you will be with us as we look forward to a new week ahead. For those of us who are going back to our hometowns or wherever we go this week, Father, we speak your presence over our lives. That, Lord, as we even talk to our relatives or, or spend time in, on, on holiday or in celebration, Father, we will always remember you. We will always remember the God who is with us and who has called us to be with him. And so, Father, we bless each and every one of my brothers and sisters here. And, Lord, we speak your presence and your life to to, to become so real and so powerful this week. We commit all of this into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.